There we go. Well, thank you so much for being here. Many of you um, have already said hello. Thank you for uh, making my family feel welcome, and we appreciate that. Thank you so much. We came in yesterday, and I want to say thank you for the beautiful accommodations uh, that we had, uh, and we're able to stay a little and see around Washington a bit yesterday. Um, I'm not going to say much about me because, well, I feel like it's all out there, and uh, many opportunities were there. I will say this. Uh, I was told a general time frame of sermons, how long they go, but that's all out the window when the Steelers have a bye week. There's nothing to leave here and go home to watch, um, so we can go as long as we need to. Don't have to rush for the game. I'm kidding. It's a joke, uh, but I am a diehard Steelers fan, so I do relate. Uh, Mark chapter 4 is where we're going to start. No, I'm going to say this out of the gate. I don't want to alarm you. Um, the short guy normally preaches short messages. Um, but we are going to cover Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 5, and Mark chapter 6. And I only have one point to the entire message, one point, Uh, but I will say this, there's going to be some, I guess, mini sermons tucked into this one sermon. I thought about preaching, I've met several Johns today, and I enjoy meeting other Johns because it's just, it's my name. I thought about preaching from John chapter 1 and verse 6. It'd be a really short message. If you know John chapter 1 and verse 6, here's the verse. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Let's pray and go home. All right, no, I'm kidding. Um, That'd be a really short message. Didn't go that route. We're going to go with Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 5, Mark chapter 6. Um, I want to say this uh, by preface. Um, I'm glad. I'm really glad uh, to look out and to see um, some children, some younger faces. Um, You'll you'll find out briefly. um, I, I am... Uh, I do have some energy. I only had two cups of coffee today. Um, I skipped the donuts because I didn't need the sugar. Um, and, and I don't do the things I do. I, I want to say this right. I, it's by any means not to make a mockery or to... Um, I just... Let me say it this way. Sometimes we read the Bible. And why we're going to Mark 4, 5, and 6, as, you, as we dive into this, we're going to see miracle after miracle after miracle that Jesus performed And sometimes if we've been around church any length of time, if we've been brought up in church especially, we get over some of these stories. We teach them in children's church, uh, but sometimes, maybe too often, we almost grow numb to these stories. And when I read the Bible personally, this is just me, I love to plug myself into the story. What do I mean by that? Uh, Let's take Lazarus, just for an example. It's not in the stories we're reading today, but if you would have been present, if I would have been present, when Jesus spoke the words and said, Lazarus, come forth. And we actually witnessed firsthand a man who had been dead for three days take breath again, what would your reaction be? We kind of get over some of that. when we're, I, 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 Again, I'm not saying this. I would I'd probably lose my mind. I would probably, I'm not going to do it now, but I would probably scream a little. I'd probably be a little scared. I'd be a little, to actually be there. And so as we look at Mark 4, 5, and 6, uh, we're going to see miracle after miracle after miracle. We're going to start at the end of Mark chapter 4, a very uh, familiar passage, a very familiar story, the calming of the sea. Uh, The disciples and Jesus himself uh, were traveling and doing his ministry. And at the end of the chapter, in Mark chapter 5, at verse 36, it it says that they'd sent the multitude away and they were with Jesus and went into the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. You can read through the story here and see there arose a great storm. Now, that is in there on purpose. Keep in mind that several of the disciples were fishermen. Several of the disciples were familiar with life on the sea. You can read through this passage and you find out that the greater the storm got, everyone on the ship began to be fearful. Uh, They were uh, getting afraid of, how are we going to stay afloat? There arose a great storm, a wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he, meaning Jesus, was in the back part of the ship asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said uh, unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. I think about this story. 
uh, what comes next. What, what would you have been like? What would I have been like if in the midst of this, this panic, this chaos, uh, they go and find Jesus and he's asleep and they wake him up and they say, uh, Master, don't you care that we're going to die? <laughs> we don't read that he says anything to them. Really, he goes, comes up from the back part of the ship and he says, Peace, be still. And in that moment, I don't know if you've ever witnessed a, a storm at sea, but to think of a storm like this, the, the noise that it would have created, the, the wind beating against the ship, the, the waves crashing in, how loud that would have been. They were probably screaming back and forth at each other. Where's Jesus? We've got to wake him up. Where, no, why is he not here? Throw this over, but we've got to save ourselves, and there's probably all sorts of chaos. Jesus comes up and he says, peace be still, and now everything just ceases. There's a calmness. Can you imagine? We don't read this in Scripture, but this is where my mind goes. What did the disciples say to each other in that moment? Now, me personally, I'm not trying to take Scripture too far. We, we don't see that this is in there, but we know enough about the disciples. My, my mind goes to Peter. Peter's probably the one now in this moment looking at all the other disciples going, In fact, we read that the statement was made, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey his voice? What kind of human being is this? I've never, he told everything to be still, and it what? And they're probably whispering back and forth to each other. They're, they're probably trying to figure out, I've never seen anything like this. And, and Jesus senses that because he comes back to them and he asks them why they're so afraid. He arose, rebuked the wind, said, Peace be still, and the wind ceased. There was a great calm, and he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? What are you afraid of? How is it that you have no faith? Because he knew, in verse 41, that they feared exceedingly. They said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Can I say, here's just maybe a mini message in this message. They were searching for peace in the midst of a storm. The first thing we can say about that is peace will never happen until you first go to Jesus. Peace will never happen until first you... They, there was this storm taking place, and what they had to do was go to where Jesus was, and they woke him up in the hindered part of the ship. Not only peace will never come until you go to Jesus, but secondly, the peace he gives will pass beyond your wildest imagination. It, it'll be beyond your mind. They're asking each other, what manner of man is this? We've never seen anything like this, but I love this next one. In chapter 5, verse 1, it says, And they came over unto the other side of the sea. Can I say, they witnessed the very peace of God. And what a, what a joyous occasion that is. If you have ever witnessed the peace of God, you, you have witnessed something special. The Bible tells us it's a peace that passes understanding. And can I say this? It's a comforting place to be. But they didn't just stay there in the boat. What we read in chapter 5 is, they kept on going beyond it. They came to the other side. Hey, yes, we need to go to Jesus and find that peace. That peace will pass beyond our, mild, our wildest imagination. But once you experience the peace of God, can I say this? Keep on going. Keep living the Christian life. Keep trusting in Jesus. Now, here's the thing. I want to point this out. After this miracle, the disciples, the Bible says this, they were fearful and they were afraid. We're going to come back to it, but I want you to make a note of that. After this miracle, in Mark chapter 4, at the end of the chapter, he does this great thing, and it's noticed right away that the disciples were fearful and afraid. Now, it's almost as though, as you go Mark 4, and then the rest of this time through Mark chapter 5, it just, it goes quick. I don't know, I've tried to study this out, I've tried to look, but it seems as though definitely these first two stories for sure are just boom, boom, back to back. The best I have studied, the best I've looked into this, you talk about a crazy day. The storm just was calmed before their very eyes, and now we're at Mark chapter 5, and as you begin to read that, here's, here's really what the Bible says, it says as they got to their place, coming to the other side of the sea, they came to the place of the Gadareans. And the Bible says this, and immediately, it, some, some translations say, and straight away, immediately as they were getting out of their boat, there came a man with an unclean spirit. This is the same day. 
They just came to the other side of the sea. They just came out of this storm. They're probably still trying to wrap their mind around what just happened. I've never seen anything like this in my life. What in the world just... And they're no doubt tying up the boat. They're probably talking amongst themselves. Did you see? I mean, he just said, peace be still. And it stopped. I, I don't know. And as they're talking, as they're tying up the boat, as they're trying to wrap their mind around what had just happened, brace yourself. I'm, I'm giving you warning. It's coming. They're tying up the boat. And they hear, I got some of you. I saw it. And they look up. And immediately, that's the word in the Bible, straight away, this man is running towards them. The Bible gives us his description. You can reference it in other Gospels, but here's what we know about this man. First and foremost, probably the most noticeable thing, he was unclothed. He's running towards them. The Bible says he had his dwelling in the cemetery. He, he lived in a graveyard. The Bible tells us that he had fetters around his wrists, and he had fetters around his ankles. He would live in the cemeteries. They tried to bind him. It said night and day he would cut himself and cry out. This is the man that's greeting them as they come to the other side of the sea. (laughs) Can you imagine? You ever had, we often reference Mondays being Monday. This has got to be the disciples' Monday. The storm, now it's calmed. They're tying up the boat, thinking that was really cool. I've never seen anything like this. And now, all of a sudden, here comes this crazy man. What do you do? I think, I, again, my mind wanders on some of these. Do you try to cover Jesus' eyes? Do you cover your own eyes? What do you, the guy, I, you're like, what is going on? Jesus enters into a conversation with this man. Right away, Jesus recognizes his condition. And can I say this? His condition, above all else, is a condition that this man is separated from Christ. He enters into a conversation with him and finds out that this man is actually indwelt by multiple demons. In fact, as they carry a conversation, Jesus asks, what is your name? And the response is given, we are legion. Our name is legion, for we are many. Multiple demons indwelling in this man. They plead with Christ, please, please be fair to us, please be kind to us. And the demons recognized just on the other hillside was a herd of pigs. The demons actually pleaded and said to Christ, would you please send us into those swine, send us into those pigs. And so Jesus does that. He casts out these demons into the 2,000 pigs on the other side of the hill. Now, what this would have been like, I have no idea. Again, I see it in my mind's eye. As these demons went into the pigs, all of the pigs simultaneously, the Bible says, ran over a cliff and were choked off in the sea. They drowned. What would that have been like? Can you enter with me for just a moment to see 2,000 pigs running off a cliff? I envision it best I could put it in towards as a pig waterfall. I have no idea. But here's really where my mind enters into this story. It references that there were pig herders with these swine. Men, maybe women, but people who were there taking care of the pigs. I don't know if that would have been a difficult job, an easy job. I arrive at this in my own mind. It's got to be easier than herding cats, but herding pigs... And all of a sudden, they all rear up their heads. I would imagine it'd be pretty creepy. All the pigs just, boom, rear up their heads, turn and take off running. And you realize, you recognize right away, they're running towards the cliff, and they go off the cliff. The Bible tells us that those men went into town to share what had happened. Can you imagine that story? Um, I, let's, let's name Bill. The, I, sorry if there's a bill here. I, I'm not offended. But Bill goes into town. <laughs> bill says, um, guys, you're never going to believe what happened. They say, Bill, what are you doing here? Aren't you supposed to be out taking care of the pigs? And he says, yeah, about that. Um, there's no pigs anymore. Well, what do you mean? You, you had like, what, 2,000? Yeah. Yeah, they all ran off a cliff. All of them? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I saw a group of guys over on the other hill. They were talking to the crazy guy that always cuts himself and screams. 
I have no idea, but I've I got to think the two are tied together. Meanwhile, back with Christ and the disciples, this man is now spending time with Christ. Christ recognized his condition, and now there was a change that had taken place in his life. A, a change, or, or can I say, a, a conversion that had taken place. He, he's sitting down with Christ, and in fact, in the conversation, he's asking, can I be one of the people that travels with you? As you go from city to city, can I join this journey with you and with the disciples? It was uh, about this time that the pig herders came back with an angry mob. And they begin to put the pieces of the story together. And now what we end up reading is that they themselves are afraid of Jesus and all that he is capable of. They're asking him to leave town. They're, if I could say it this way, they're kicking him out of town. Verse 18 says of chapter 5, when he was, uh, and when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for you and hath had compassion on you. <laughs> He's now clothed, seated in his right mind, pleading with Christ, could I go with you? But the people were afraid. They're asking Jesus to leave. And Jesus actually gives this answer to this maniac, as we refer to him. You can't go with me, you have a job. You are to stay here and tell everybody what had happened to you. He gave him a charge. He was giving him a commission. He was saying, no, no, your job is to tell everyone around the change that took place in your life. Now, catch this just for a moment. We'll keep going through Mark chapter 5. He recognized, first and foremost, this man's condition. Apart from Christ, this man was lost. May I say to you this morning, each and every one of us sitting in this room, our condition as human beings, apart from Jesus Christ, were lost. But Christ recognized that in this man the same as he recognizes it in you and I. And the Bible tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his son, he, he chose to die on a sinner's cross for our payment. And through that, accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior, the same as this maniac had spent time with God and was changed, you and I can be changed. You and I can experience a conversion where we can place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But know this, it does not end there. If you have ever placed your faith and trust in Christ, knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it doesn't just end with the conversion. There's another step. There's a charge. There's a commission that's given to each and every one of us. And now you and I, the same as this crazy man, our job is to go and tell people about the change that took place in our lives. But he was kicked out of town for fear. The Bible tells us he begins to travel again. He comes to a new place. And it's interesting, when Jesus, verse 21, was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him. And he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, synagogue Jairus, by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray, I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. There's a public servant, a publican, meets Jesus. Now to think about this, he is a man of somewhat prestige, a man of a public position. He came to Jesus Christ himself. He could have sent somebody. He didn't have to come on his own accord, but he came to Jesus on his own. He pleads with Jesus, will you please come to my home? My daughter is about to die. We find out later in this passage, she's only 12 years old. Can you imagine, just in, for a moment, speaking to the dads in the room? I'm one, so I can somewhat think of this in my mind. You're pleading with somebody who you know for certain can heal your daughter. Your daughter, who, his words, not mine, is about to die. We read... In short, the answer that is given, Jesus does agree to come to his home, and Jesus does agree to heal. But here's where things get interesting. 
As Jesus is following Jairus in the next few verses, he's interrupted. He's on his way to Jairus' house. We just read that there's a lot of people around, and the crowd is growing larger and larger and larger. And something happens in this crowd. I want to share this with you. This is, without a doubt, my favorite story in all the Bible. And it's a story inside a story. My favorite story, and it may be odd, but my favorite story in all of Scripture is the story we're about to look at of the woman with the issue of blood. The Bible speaks in these next few verses and says this, she was sick for 12 years. The Bible says she, she spent all of her money, she tried everything she could, she used all of her means to get better, and she never did. And the only thing I can think, I mean, I am just drawn to the story, and, and in fairness, the only thing I can think is this, she was not a quitter. Like, I, I'm a very competitive person. That's just who I am. I like sports. I like all those things. It, it is, I know I joked earlier, I, I will tell you, it is very hard for me to sit right now and watch the Steelers because I am a competitive person. I'm really glad I have a foam brick that I can throw at my TV and not a real one. It's just who I am. I'm competitive. I always played sports, played through injuries, all of those things. I, I just am competitive in nature. I don't like playing with people who give up. It angers me in some ways when people give, you know, those Monopoly games that go on for five days and then finally someone quits. Why? We played for five days. Why quit now? Let me beat you. I just don't like quitting. And I read the story of this woman, and the Bible says she spent everything for 12 years. She tried everything she could for 12 years. And where most people would just say, well, I guess I've got this forever, <laughs> she never quit. She never gave up. And the Bible says, when she heard, it's actually what's used in the Bible, when she heard that Jesus was in town, not that she saw him yet, when she heard that he was coming in town, she thought, this is it. This is my moment. This is the time where I know I can go and witness the healer firsthand. Based off her disease, it's very likely that she was considered unclean and had to live on the outskirts of town. She would have had to have cloaked herself in some way to get in amongst this crowd. She would have been frail, brittle, and weak, but somehow she pressed her way through that mob of people. She got so close to Christ that she simply reached out and touched just the hem of his garment, the very edge. And the Bible says, here's the word again, it's used in this passage, she, immediately she was healed. And in that moment, with these hundreds of people thronging him, Jesus says to his disciples, wait, stop, stop. Somebody just touched me. And the disciples almost, you can read it this way, they almost make mockery of it. And they say, well, uh, Jesus, there's, there's hundreds of people here. Of course, somebody touched you. Do, do you see this crowd of people? And he said, no, no. You can read it. It says this way, knowing that virtue had gone out of him. No, no, this touch this touch was something different. There was something different about this touch. A, and, and I have to think, in that moment, Jesus, he's God in the flesh. He already knew. But Jesus begins to scan the crowd, looking for who touched him. Can you imagine this moment? This moment as Jesus is looking out over the crowd of people amongst him, and there was a moment where his eyes locked in with her eyes. And for a moment, she, the Bible says, she knew that she was healed. She knew instantly. And now she's looking at the Messiah. She's looking at her healer. And the Bible actually says this. She came before him, fearing and trembling. She fell at his feet and worshipped him. He looked at her and said, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. You see, she suffered, <laughs> she had spent all that she had, and now she's witnessing so great a salvation in her own life. <laughs> I think about this woman. Now, it's interesting, because as we read about her, we read that she fell fearing and trembling. As we read about the maniac, we read that the people chased him out of town because they were fearful of his power. We read after the calming of the storm that the disciples were fearful and afraid. In every one of these miracles that Jesus did, we read of fear. We don't actually read it by title when we read Jairus. What can I tell you? Just thinking about being a dad, 
looking at the idea of possibly losing one of my children, that's a scary thought. That's a thought that instills fear in me. I can only imagine how Jarius is feeling. Now, we had hit pause on the Jarius story. Jarius is standing by the wayside over here, watching what had just happened with this woman who was sick for 12 years. No doubt part of him was glad for her. But there's another side of him thinking, good for you, what about my daughter? There's another part where maybe he's pacing, thinking in his mind, we don't have time for this. What is going on? My daughter, we were on, we were on our way to my house so you could visit my daughter and heal my daughter. And the two different contrasts that could be taking place in this story. This woman who had been healed after 12 years, no doubt inwardly and outwardly celebrating and expressing gratitude. And Jarius is anxious. Maybe even showing we don't read it, maybe even some displeasure. And while Jesus is speaking to this woman, the Bible actually says in verse 35, while he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? Now catch this in verse 36. It's pretty big. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. Be not afraid, only believe. Believe. Did you catch this? The ruler of the synagogue, the, the servant came to Jairus and said to Jairus, Your daughter is dead. Why are you still bothering Jesus? We never actually read Jairus' response. I, I want to say this because this is, this is big for me. When Jairus received the worst news of his entire life. The very next phrase we read is this, when Jesus heard what was spoken. May I say this to you, wherever you are in your life, when you feel as though you have just received the worst news that you have ever received, may I encourage you, as I have been encouraged by this thought, this principle, Christ already knows. He's already there with you. He's in your presence. The same as he was in Jairus' presence. Jesus Christ is right there, and he knows exactly what you're going through. And the same words that I believe Jesus spoke to Jairus are the same words that you and I can be encouraged by today. Don't be afraid. Only believe. What would it have been like? We never read the rest of this entire chapter. We never read anything that Jairus said. We don't read that he said anything. In fact, as they travel the rest of the way to Jairus' house, Jesus picks his inner circle of disciples. He then goes with Jairus, and they begin to make their way to Jairus' house. The Bible tells us as they got close to the house, they could hear the women inside crying and wailing. And rightfully so, understandably so. There's no doubt a mama inside this home crying over her 12-year-old daughter. Disciples have been going through quite a day. They're now getting ready to enter into the home where this mama, where this dad, are experiencing such a great tragedy. I think in Jarius, I think of Jarius as he's taking every step back to his house. He's probably, as I, I, I want to say I would be, replaying those words Christ said to me over and over again. Don't be afraid. Only believe. Don't be afraid. Only believe. Don't be afraid. They get to the home. They go up into the room, and Jesus actually makes this remark. Why are you so sad? Why are you weeping? Why are you crying? This young girl, she's not dead. She's just sleeping. Now, she was, she was dead. He was referencing it in a different way. Everyone in the room made fun of Christ, made mockery of Christ, saying oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And Christ then 
kicks them all out of the room. He literally, if I could say it this way, speaks life back into this 12-year-old girl. She comes back to life. In that moment, what would that have been like? The celebration that would have taken place. I worked with teenagers for many years, and I can tell you this, we definitely know that this girl is in her preteens because once she was healed, the very first thing Christ says about this girl is, okay, now go get her something to eat. She's probably hungry. And they do. The celebration that there would have been, but I think about this. And I don't have to think very long or hard about it. (sighs) Do you think Jarius was believing that Christ could bring his daughter back from the dead? Without a doubt in my mind, as a dad standing here today, if I put myself in this story, if I had to enter into that, I'm thinking, oh man, if Christ told me to believe and I had already heard that my daughter was dead, I wouldn't necessarily know what the next steps were, but I know what I would want the next steps to be, and I would think in my own mind, Christ could do it. I'm going to believe in it. I'm going to trust in him. I'm going to... And I think about these two things. In every situation we read from Mark 4 up until this point at Mark 5, in every miracle there was fear. And it's one thing to say, well, let's just eliminate the fear, but you've got to replace it with something else. And that's where that phrase fully comes together. Don't be afraid, comma, only believe. Believe that we serve a God who is able and capable to do big things. Believe that we serve a God who is able and capable to do the impossible things. Because without that belief, here's the question. Can miracles take place? And that brings us to Mark chapter 6. Christ went back to his hometown where people knew him, where he was familiar, where they knew him by name, they knew his upbringing, they knew his life. And in Mark chapter 6, it says, verse 2, And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which giveth unto him? And even such mighty works that are wrought by his hands. They've heard his wisdom and they've seen his works. They've actually seen what he's capable of. (laughs) But then they're questioning in verse 3, Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James? We, We know this guy. We're familiar with him. And in verse 5, one of the saddest verses that we will read The Bible says, He could there do no mighty works, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick and healed them. And verse 6, He marveled because of their unbelief. Just a few verses ago, he said, Be not afraid, only believe. Now he's in his hometown, and the Bible says he's marveled, he's amazed, he's astonished, he's taken back because of their unbelief. I'm going to boil this down to two things. The first is this, on an individual basis. I have no idea in this room what you're facing in your personal life. I've met several of you today. Almost every single one of you came and shook my hand. You introduced me, or introduced yourself to me. You told me your name. I remember some of them. And uh, you said... Hi, it's nice to meet you. But based off of that alone, I can't tell you what's going on in your life. I just don't, simply I don't know. But I think of these stories. We came into Mark chapter 4 and there was a storm. Maybe you're sitting here today and there's a storm that's taking place in your life. Uh, maybe, uh, Maybe it's a troubling situation, a troubling time. Maybe there's a storm in your life that you're going through. Oh, can I say to you, don't be afraid. Only belief. Because if you allow unbelief to take over, you could be caught in that storm for a very long time. I look at the second thing. There was a whole lot of craziness taking place in the second story. We literally referenced that story as the maniac of Gadara. He was a crazy person. Maybe there's some craziness that's taking place in your life right now, and you just simply can't wrap your head around it. <laughs> May I say to you, don't be afraid. Only believe. Uh, Maybe, listen, maybe it's sickness that has entered into your life or a family member's life. 
May I encourage you as you walk through that? May I encourage you to believe? You say, you know, this, this is a hard one. I've had family sickness come into our family. It's a hard one to say, don't be afraid, only believe. I know that, but I'm looking at the words of Christ. And above all, I want to encourage you, don't allow unbelief to take root and to settle in. And then I think of the last story as death entered into the family. And that's a hard time. It's a trying time. Within the last two years, uh, in my own family, in, in our lives, we have lost multiple, multiple people. It's been difficult uh, for our family. It's been difficult for our children. But I look at that and I think, oh man, don't be afraid. Only believe. Believe that we serve a God who's all-knowing. We serve a God who works all things together for our good. But I want to go beyond just personal here for just a moment. I'm going to talk to Abundant Life Baptist Church. I want to say this. I think of, listen, the church as a whole. May it never be said of us as individuals, or may it never be said of this church. I'm going to quote scripture. And there, he could do no mighty work because of their unbelief. May it never be said of Abundant Life Baptist Church, God couldn't do anything there because of their unbelief. But instead, may it be said of this church, that's a church. That's a church that believes in what God can do. And because of that, they have seen great miracles take place throughout their ministries. Don't be afraid. Only believe. Father, I thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. I thank you for stories such as this in your word that we can read. And God, we can realize that you are a miracle-working God. I pray that you would help us to never get over your miracle-working power. God, I pray that you would help us to celebrate but I pray that you would help us to share that. The same as you gave a charge and a commission to this man we read about. God, I pray that you would help us as believers to step into that same charge, into that same calling. And God, I pray that we will be able to tell others about the salvation we experienced to see others come to a saving knowledge of you as well. Lord, looking across to this congregation today, no doubt many situations in life are represented. And God, I pray that you will show yourself in each and every one of them. I pray that unbelief will not take over, take hold, but God, in each and every one of these situations, may, may there be expressed belief in a miracle-working God. In your name we do pray. For just a moment, I don't know the norm. I really don't. But if I can ask with heads bowed and eyes closed, if for just a moment, <laughs> I'm by no way, by no means wanting to make any mockery of this, but can I simply ask this question? You would be sitting in here today and you would simply say, Pastor, Pastor John, there, there are some things in my life, whether it's family, whether it's personal, there are some things that, yes, I'm going through. And I realize today, <laughs> I'm fearful of those things, but I just simply need to believe in God. I, I need to believe that He knows what He's doing. I need to believe that ultimately He's in charge of this thing. But Pastor John, there, there's some things in my life. Now, I'm asking this question simply for this, for prayer. Would you be so bold today, sitting in here, there's some things in my own life <laughs> that have taken hold would you be so bold as to maybe slip up your hand? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Several hands raised. Thank you. I also ask this question with heads bowed and eyes closed. Reference the maniac, his condition, his conversion, and his commission. Maybe you're sitting in here today, and you never placed your faith and trust in Christ. You realize that your condition, much like his, is apart from Christ. And that conversion, you've, you've never placed your faith and trust in Christ, accepting Him as your personal Savior. 
And if that's you today, I, I want to encourage you. Man, Christ is there with open arms, the same as He was willing to talk to this crazy person. Maybe you're sitting in here today and you say, I, I've never trusted Christ as my Savior. I've never trusted Him as my Lord. With heads bowed, eyes closed, if there's anyone in here today who would be so brave, be so bold to maybe slip up their hand and say, that's me. I've never trusted Christ. Today, many have raised their hand and said, there's something going on in my life and I simply want to give that over to Christ. I, I want to show belief. Again, I don't know what's the norm, I don't know the custom. I'm going to ask if, just for a moment, I'm going to ask if, in this moment right now, if the piano would begin to play. And if you're sitting here today, and you say, there's something in my life, I just need to believe God. In the stillness of this moment, all of us together, where we all stand to our feet, go ahead, stand as you are. I don't know what's accustomed. I'm doing something maybe that's different, and that's Okay. If you raised your hand and said, there's something in my life where I need to express belief, as the piano plays, would you be so bold? And again, maybe this is different. Maybe you've never done it. Would you be so bold as to leave your seat and come pray at the front of this church? Come pray and say, God, there's something in my life. You know what that is, but Lord, I'm giving it over to you. As the piano plays, if you would be so bold to give that over to God in the stillness of this moment, would you leave your seat? If not, that's okay. An old-fashioned altar call, years gone by, not many. It's not often done anymore. But if God is speaking to your heart and you would like to come and pray, you're welcome to do so.